Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to today's session of the GovTran final um, series. Um, I see that people are still coming in, but I think I can start with some introductory remarks just to introduce today's session and our speakers as we are waiting for the remaining attendees to join the session. Um, it's really my pleasure today to moderate today's session. Um, this is our third event in the GovTran final conference series. My name is Claire Dupont. I'm Professor of European Governance at Ghent University, and I will be moderating today's session. This series of events marks the end of the first three-year term of the Jean Monnet Network of GovTran, which stands for Governing the EU's Climate and Energy Transition in Turbulent Times. This GovTran project is led by the Free University of Brussels, Freie Universite Brussel, in collaboration with Ghent University, the University of East Anglia, and the University of Eastern Finland. As part of the project, we have published several special issues, policy briefs, we've organized a MOOC, a series of events, including this final conference series, and on our website, you can find links to all of these uh, publications and reports about our events, including also podcasts and interviews with people involved in our network. The project aims to examine EU climate and energy policy against the background of broader turbulence, broader geopolitical shifts, and also with a view to bridging academic and policy discussions. Last week, you already had an excellent first event with keynote speaker Diedrich Samson, and we also had a roundtable discussion on EU trade and climate policies. Today, we'll delve into discussions on citizen participation and the European Green Deal. And around the world and in Europe, more and more citizen participation and deliberative democratic processes have been set up. And we are here today to discuss what this means for the development of the European Green Deal into the future. Before I introduce the speakers, I'd like to draw your attention to the household uh, remarks. Please note that the webinar is being recorded. Um, we also would strongly encourage you all to post your questions and comments in the Q&A function in Zoom. We will try and take up these questions in the question and answer session at the end. Uh, we have three speakers today, each of whom will present their uh, perspectives on the broader issue of citizen participation in the European Green Deal. And once all three speakers have um, taken the floor, we will then open for discussion. We have an hour and a half for today's session, and I'm sure that that would be sufficient time also to lead to a nice discussion. So now let me introduce our very distinguished speakers for today. I'm very pleased to welcome uh, Dr. Deer Mitorni, who is Assistant Professor in the School of Law and Government at Dublin City University. He will be opening our session today, giving some academic insights into our uh, understanding of democratic, deliberative democratic processes and citizen participation in general. Next, we will have Lise Desotel speaking, uh, uh, building on her experiences of the French uh, Climate Assembly, the Convention Citoyenne. She is a consultant on climate policies and citizen participation in particular. And finally, we will have Kasia Balutska Debska, who is the European Climate Pact lead at the European Commission, and she will be connecting the full discussion um, to what exactly the European Green Deal in, intends and what are the future visions for citizen participation in this context. Um, that being said, I would also invite all of you to have a look at the GovTran website. You should find a link also to the future seminars in our uh, Q&A box or our chat box, which will appear shortly. Um, and you are certainly welcome to register for all future seminars. But I'm very pleased to see that so many of you have joined us for this discussion today and that many people are still joining. Um, but without further hesitation, I would like to pass the floor to Dermot Torney for his presentation. And Dermot, the floor is yours. Yeah, thanks so much for that introduction and thank you for the invitation to uh, join you for this, uh, what I'm sure will be a very uh, very interesting and stimulating uh, discussion. So, Claire, can you tell me, are you seeing my, my presentation okay? Yes, thank you. Great. Um, delighted uh, to be here and to be part of the, the closing of this first phase of, of GovTran. I've, I've followed the, the progress of the, the network with, with great interest, and indeed I've participated in, in some of the, the previous workshops, uh, and so, it's, so it's, it's lovely to be a part of um, the, the conclusion of, of this first phase, as, as you put it, Claire. Um, 
My aim uh, in, in the presentation is to uh, offer some general remarks uh, about the role of citizen participation in climate transitions in general and the, the European uh, Green, uh, Green Deal. Um, uh, asking what role uh, processes of citizen participation and deliberation can play in climate transitions. Uh, noting that uh, these kinds of innovations are increasingly pre uh, prevalent, but uh, that tensions remain. And then using, uh, at the end of my remarks, the, the example of Ireland's experience uh, of running a citizens' assembly to tackle the, the, the question of, of how Ireland should respond to climate change, to, to um, tease out some of these uh, tensions, these opportunities and, and tensions. So to start off with some general remarks about the role of participation and deliberation in uh, climate transitions. Stepping back a minute, uh, we can think about a number of different uh, reasons for considering and integrating public perspectives in, uh, in decision making on the European Green Deal on climate transitions. Uh, but, but also in public policy uh, making more, more generally. So uh, there's a normative reason for, for doing so, that it's the right thing to do from, from, a, from, a, from a, a principled uh, standpoint. Citizens ought to have their, their views represented in, in policy making. Uh, there's an instrumental uh, reason, which is that we get more effective outcomes, we get less pushback from citizens uh, if they feel that they've been included in, in decision making. And there's also potentially a substantive reason that uh, we, we may get stronger outcomes. And th this is an interesting observation in, in the case of climate change and, and uh, environment, though not, not without some tensions, and I'll come back to, to those uh, later in my remarks. Um, focusing particularly on uh, the role of deliberative or the relationship between deliberative democracy and climate change and climate change policy making, there's there's a now significant strand in uh, the literature arguing that deliberative democracy is well placed to deal with environmental issues, uh, but also well placed to deal with um, a broader set of public policy challenges that are characterized by complexity by uh, long time horizons and by value conflicts uh, and, and trade-offs. And if we, if we think about each of those points in, in the context of climate change and other environmental issues, I think we can, you know, we can confidently tick all three of those, those uh, boxes. Uh, a, a, a recent report by the OECD published last year um, set out, <clears throat> uh, 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 identified uh, an, a number of criteria for when we should use public uh, deliberation in decision making. Uh, they're, they're on the screen there. You can see uh, where broad concern uh, exists within a community, uh, but there is no clear right answer to what, what the, the solution should be. Um, that a range of people must act uh, in order to be a, uh, for effective response. Um, that additional perspectives, new ideas may help, um, where citizens have not had the opportunity to consider alternative courses of action and their long-term consequences, and where decisions of policymakers need to be informed by public judgment, as well as expert evidence. And once again, um, hopefully, as I was talking through each of those, you maybe have climate change or another environmental issue uh, in, in your mind. But, but I think, again, uh, we, can, we can confidently tick each of these boxes to a greater or lesser extent when we think about climate change uh, and, and the broader European uh, Green Deal uh, agenda. Uh, and so though my, my remarks so far have talked in relatively general terms about uh, deliberative democracy, but I want to zone in now on a, a particular institutional form, uh, and that is what's sometimes called in the literature deliberative uh, mini publics, uh, defined by Gooden and Dreisek as groups small enough to be genuinely deliberative and representative enough to be genuinely uh, democratic and, and building on those, those criteria, uh, Farrell and colleagues recently set out uh, a, a range of core design features of deliberative mini public. So they said that they should be um, 
by definition, they should be deliberative uh, in the sense that it's not simply an aggregation of atomized preferences. It's not an, opi an opinion poll or a standard election where you gather the views of, of the, the electorate or, or the public, um, but rather deliberation is, is put at the, at the core. That is to say, uh, participants receive experts uh, or receive various sources of, of, uh, of knowledge from experts, potentially from other stakeholders. Um, but then crucially, they have time to reflect upon and deliberate with, uh, with other members of, of the, the public who quite possibly or even probably have different views, uh, worldviews uh, and preferences to, to, to them themselves. Uh, and that deliber deliberation needs to be conducted in a, in a respectful, re respectful manner uh, and according to certain, certain ground rules. The second core design feature of deliberative many publics is the representative uh, nature of these processes. And that's not representative in the accountability sense of uh, participants being uh, accountable to the wider public in, in the way that elected officials uh, are, but, but it is representative in, in being a kind of a mirror image of, of the wider public. So participants in these processes are selected um, usually by by um, sortition, but so so that um, the the participants look like the wider population. It, it's it's a subset of the wider population, but in terms of key demographic criteria like uh, age, geography, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, education, and so forth, that the the subset of the uh, look like the the wider public or the mini public looks like the maxi public. So that's all by way of, of, of background and, and introduction and, and theory and, and concepts. Um, but one of the, the interesting and exciting developments uh, in recent years is that these kinds of de democratic innovations are increasingly prevalent uh, in the area of climate change, environment, but also addressing a range of, of other uh, issues. Um, they're, they're, they're increasingly prevalent at multiple levels uh, of governance at, uh, in multiple EU member states and beyond. Uh, and there is a wider resonance of uh, the idea of this kind of institution and, and particularly a clustering around the idea of, of a citizen's assembly. And so on the right there, you can see uh, an Im a campaigning image from uh, Extinction Rebellion, Rebellion calling for a citizen's uh, assembly. Now, I, I should note that Extinction Rebellion uh, have a particular view of uh, the the role of uh, such an assembly and uh, how the outputs should be incorporated into uh, the wider democratic process. And I'll come back to that in my uh, in my closing remarks. Um, there are a range of examples of climate assemblies or, or similarly. Uh, designed similarly titled institutions. These are some, some examples from Ireland, the UK, Scotland, France, uh, Denmark, Finland, and Washington State in, in, the, uh, in the US. Uh, and Lise, uh, as Claire said in the introduction, uh, is going to talk in more detail about the, the French experience. And I'll offer some brief remarks about the Irish experience uh, towards the end of my uh, presentation. Um, so, so there's there's growing practice, but there's also diverse practice. Uh, there is little codification to date of um, of design characteristics. So, different uh, different countries, different jurisdictions, different govern governance levels are essentially still at the experimentation stage. We haven't uh, settled on a focal point on a on a. Uh, a core set of uh, design uh, characteristics, not, notwithstanding the efforts of academics and practitioners to codify uh, core design standards, and, and that work is, is ongoing, uh, including in, in the context of, of uh, climate governance. There are also some tensions uh, remaining uh, around trying to balance the, the tension or manage the tension between ambition, the scale of transition, uh, transition required in order to meet the Paris Agreement goals, uh, and, and acceptability, uh, pub public uh, acceptance. Um, and there are also tensions around how uh, the outputs of a citizens' assembly or similar process 
ought to be integrated into representative democratic uh, politics. And I want to, um, in, in the final part of my presentation, just say a little bit about Ireland's experience in, in this regard, because Ireland was one of the early adopters of the Citizens' Assembly model, and in 2017, used the Citizens' Assembly to deliberate uh, on, on climate change. Uh, and so we have the benefit of a bit more hindsight in, in the Irish case in, in looking at what has transpired since both, both during the Citizens' Assembly, but also in, in climate policymaking uh, in, in the aftermath of the, uh, of the Citizens' Assembly. So by way of background, um, Ireland Citizens' Assembly, um, the one I'm talking about was established by resolution of Parliament in July 2016. Um, this was... Uh, depending on, on definitions on how you count, this was either the, uh, the, the second or the third uh, of uh, three or four um, uh, national del deliberative uh, processes. Uh, the first one was conducted uh, as a kind of a, a proof of concept by, by academics, um, which is why I'm equivocating on, on whether that's, that's counted. But we have had um, three national citizens' assemblies uh, in Ireland, most recent on, on gender equality. But the, the one that focused on climate change uh, ran from 2016 to 2018. Um, it consisted of a chairperson, uh, retired Supreme Court judge, uh, Mary Lefoy, and uh, 99 citizens randomly selected to be broadly representative of the Irish electorate in terms of a, a range of demographic characteristics that they remarked upon uh, earlier. Uh, and climate change was one of five topics uh, on the agenda of this uh, assembly. It's perhaps best known for its work uh, to consider whether Ireland's restrictive, then restrictive abortion laws should be uh, liberalised. Um, but one of the other uh, four topics, uh, and arguably the most prominent of the four remaining topics, was the topic of climate change, uh, on which the Citizens' Assembly deliberated over two weekends in the autumn of uh, 2017. Uh, and uh, it came up with a number of notable recommendations. Um, there was voting on a ballot paper at, at the end. 80% of the participants said they would be willing to, willing to pay higher taxes on carbon intensive uh, activities. 97% uh, recommended that the state should end all subsidies for uh, peat extraction, which is a politically quite controversial uh, topic. Um, in, in Ireland, think Poland and coal or East Germany and coal. Um, peat is, in some respects, Ireland's, uh, Ireland's uh, equivalent. Um, and 89% of the members recommended that there should be a tax on greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture, uh, a particularly controversial topic in, in the context of climate policy making in, in Ireland. And so what happened, the recommendations, I, I said uh, a minute ago that we have the benefit of hindsight um, uh, in, in, the, in the sense that it is now coming up to four years since, in fact, it is four years this month since the, the first weekend of those deliberations on climate change. And so we can trace what happened, the recommendations. So they were published uh, in April 2018 uh, in the form of, of a report from the Citizens' Assembly. What happened then was interesting because a special parliamentary committee, uh, uh, all party parliamentary committee was established with a specific mandate to deliberate on the deliberations. So to, to consider uh, in, in an extended fashion, the recommendations of, of the citizens assembly and that arguably imbued the, the recommendations of the assembly with, with a broader sense of democratic legitimacy because these were elected officials uh, in turn deliberating on the, the recommendations uh, of the, the citizens assembly uh, itself. Um, those uh, recommendations from the parliamentary committee, which largely though not exclusively amplified and supported the recommendations from the citizens assembly, um, informed the production of an all of government climate action plan, plan that was published uh, in June uh, 2019. Um, and then skipping forward, we, we had the formation of a, a new government uh, in uh, June 2020. Uh, and so it's, it's not a, a straightforward linear process uh, by any means, but uh, it's possible to trace a number of the key recommendations, the increase in the carbon tax, 
Um, and the, the strengthening, one thing I didn't mention on, on the previous slide, the strengthening of Ireland's climate governance architecture through a radical overhaul of, of the 2015 climate law uh, was uh, has uh, entered into force just two months ago. Uh, a new climate law was, was enacted, and that can be traced back to the the recommendations of the citizens, citizens' assembly and through each of these different steps of the, the process uh, also. The one, recommend, the, 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 the one really significant recommendation that wasn't implemented was the, the tax on greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture. I think that was a, a political step too far for, for, for Ireland's politicians. When the parliamentary committee deliberated on that, they, they merely recommended that it needed more consideration, they hadn't had enough time uh, to deliberate on it fully, which is, I guess, political speak for we don't want to touch this because it's too political, too, too politically uh, controversial. Uh, so not all of the controversial recommendations were implemented, but um, it, more broadly than the specific recommendations, I think it's fair to say that the Assembly catalyzed climate change policy making providing a, a, a focal point for media and civil society uh, campaigning. And it provided an education for members of parliament uh, that participated in, in the parliamentary uh, committee. So I guess what I'm suggesting here is that we, we should adopt a, a broad understanding of, of what impact a process like a climate assembly, a citizens assembly, uh, can can play, and Ireland's experience shows one route, one way of trying to tackle that tension between um, the, uh, the the recommendations of a process like this and the imperative of de of uh, legitimate democratic decision making through representative uh, politics. So just to, to conclude um, and to emphasize that point again, that we, we have seen a, a growth of um, national practice and subnational practice with respect to uh, citizen participation, the, the, particularly through uh, deliberative democratic uh, initiatives. Um, but I, I think, and I'll conclude with this, uh, and perhaps we can pick up on this in, in the discussion afterwards, I think there's a persistent, enduring tension between two conceptions of citizens' assemblies when we think of them in the context of climate governance. So on the one hand, we can think of them as mechanisms for inclusive decision making uh, in which we trust the outcome because we trust the process. So we accept the outcome regardless of what the process is. But I think there's another way of viewing them uh, of citizens' assemblies uh, and similar processes for climate governance, which is a means of deliver, de delivering ambitious climate policy recommendations. Uh, and, uh, and this comes back to the, to the three points by Sterling that I had early in my presentation, that we get substantively better outcomes through including uh, citizen, uh, citizens in, in decision making. Um, that the, the evidence to date shows that to be the case, but uh, it, you know, it, it is possible that in future we will, uh, as the, the, the scale of the challenge of transitioning to uh, a, a climate safe world become ever more pressing, that there may be instances in which uh, the outputs or the, the recommendations of a, of a climate assembly, for example, don't align with, with the power skills and, and then we'll be faced with answering uh, the, or, or addressing this, this tension between um, trusting the, the process regarding, re regardless of the outcome uh, and, and uh, implementing them because we think that they will deliver ambitious climate uh, policy uh, recommendation. So, so I, I think there's a lot more work to do uh, on the practitioner side uh, and, and also uh, in, in research. Uh, there's an exciting uh, agenda here uh, and I look forward to uh, hearing the contributions of the other two speakers and to engaging in the discussion afterwards. So Clara, I'll hand back to you. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, dear Mitch, for opening our discussion today, also with some very interesting insights from the Irish case, but also by bringing in the general understanding from an academic point of view. I think it's uh, very interesting to see so little codification so far, and, and clearly we have uh, much to learn from other experiences. 
Um, I would like to remind our participants that you have the opportunity to pose your questions in the Q&A box. Um, do not hesitate to do so. Um, we will gather the questions and have a discussion after each of the speakers has had their chance to present their opening remarks. Um, building now on um, what Dermot has started discussing, we're going to move next to um, Lise Desautels, um, who was closely involved in the French Convention, Convention Citoyen. Um, and Lise, I will hand the floor to you. Very much looking forward to hearing your remarks. Thank you very much, Claire, and uh, thank you very much, Dermot, for your presentation. Uh, every time I hear a new version of it, I, I find new elements I want to discuss with you. Um, so I'm going to share my screen. Uh, Claire, is it all right? Can you see it? Yes, perfectly. Thank you very much. Uh, so thank you for this invitation and this opportunity maybe to connect um, the discussions happening at the national level, very focused on the national climate goals of the member states and how they're trying to reach them and bring their population with them and connect it to the overall and key discussion of the European Green Deal. Um, uh, as Claire mentioned, I'm very humbly here to share my experience as a, an advisor to the governance committee of the French uh, Citizens Assembly on Climate, that is also known as, uh, as Claire said, as a Convention Citoyenne pour le Climat, and I will sometimes uh, refer to it as a CCC for its uh, French initial. Um, so uh, basically, I will walk you through uh, the presentation of the assembly from its background and conception to uh, its outcomes and trying to share some insights on uh, what has been a very rich experiment for, for its participants, but also for the people, for the observers and for us, the organizers of the assembly. Um, maybe and to start uh, without being very original, but looking back two years ago when the, the assembly started, uh, France was seeing as many countries at the time, uh, a very steady rise in the um, uh, awareness of the population on climate, environmental issues, and those were uh, reflected in, in polls and has have been reflected in elections uh, since then. We also saw for in 2019, for the first time, the High Council for Climate, uh, which was set by President Macron to assess uh, France's climate efforts. Um, the HCC delivered its uh, its first report, uh, and that was basically urgently calling on France to review its climate policies and uh, measures. That was uh, that that was already following a kind of crisis at the highest level in France in government due to the departure of the very famous environment minister. The fact that the climate marches uh, in France started uh, actually quite early compared to other countries, uh, even though the, the numbers of people that protested or students that went on strike uh, was probably lower than what we saw in Germany, for instance. But also, and that's probably the big elephant in the room here, the, the main uh, factor that will go in history as leading to the organization of the French Climate Assembly was certainly the Yellow Vest protests that started uh, mid-November uh, in the streets, but that had been growing on the internet before that and in the media. And that uh, will, that, that is described as being linked to the, the increase of the carbon tax in France, but has uh, and research has shown that since then that there were many factors implied as the very the important rise of uh, the prices, uh, the uh, uh, sorry gas prices for the for uh, the drivers, and there there had been many issues and many measures that they felt were against them. So that led to the protest. That was then followed by the great national debate. And you can see on this slide a photograph of the press conference that President Macron held at the closing of the debate and where he announced that following this debate that saw 
according to some estimates, three million uh, French people contri contribute to, to this debate online in their local city councils or in debates organized by the government. So President Macron concluded after this debate that uh, a citizens assembly was to be organized, that it would tackle both the issue of reaching all climate goals, especially the minus 40% by 2030, but that it would also be combined with the uh, consideration for social justice. Um, he announced that the assembly was to have 150 members of the assembly, they, that they would be drawn by lot and representative of the diversity of the French population. He also, uh, and later on, came back a lot on this uh, proposal uh, or, or commitment. Uh, he decided that the proposals would be submitted to parliament without filter uh, by the government or to a referendum or would be directly uh, implemented where it was possible for the government to do so. Um, so basically, this is where uh, all story as a governance committee started during summer 2019, and where we had to organize a sortition of those 150 members. Um, and as uh, Darmit pointed, we decided to select a certain number of criteria, gender, age, the qualification, like what kind of diploma you have, the social professional categories, uh, where are you working now? Are you in management? Are you a worker? Are you unemployed, et cetera? And the type of territory, uh, are you living in an urban area, peri-urban, or are you living in a rural part of France? And of course, the different regions of France. Um, so this usually, it, it can be presented very easily and this seems very basic, but this is also quite a job to organize that. There could have been another criteria that we decided not to have here, but that has been used in many climate assemblies uh, since then. That is the attitude towards climate change that people could have. But la later on, we had studies that showed that even though um, the members were a bit more um, inclined to pay attention to that issue, they were not so different from the general population uh, there. We also had people that were climate, that, that did not believe that climate change uh, had anything or human, the human, uh, that we didn't have anything to do with climate change. Um, so this is basically the organization of the works. Uh, so we had seven uh, sessions organized initially that those were supposed to be six and we were due to finish in January, but due to uh, social protests, due to the COVID pandemic and many things happening. And the fact that um, the members of the assembly, the citizens wanted to uh, have more time to work on their proposals. We had to add a session and we ended up in June, uh, 2020. So basically nine months after uh, the start of the assembly. Uh, with this present, with this graph, you can see that uh, the first sessions were very were dedicated to sharing information uh, with the participants, and that was done by experts uh, from IPCC, but also from the French administration, presenting the participants with the state of play of uh, the policies implemented by France and the gaps between the goals and what we could witness in, in reality. And um, from there, they started, we, they were divided in five groups that each worked on specific uh, sectorial uh, measures. So, and those were uh, designed based on the GHG emissions of France. So there was a group on transport, another one on agriculture, another one on housing, and the two last ones were consumption, um, and work uh, on the other, work and production on the other. Um, so basically they worked through those groups and then came back to the 150 plenum where they could discuss, amend and adapt the proposals. And um, as Dharmid pointed, the, the, and it's really the two core uh, design features of those assemblies. And I think that is very well illustrated by this photograph. Um, of one of the session, 
it's about uh, the representativity of the assembly. And here you can see you have a surgeon from Marseille discussing with a student from the opposite territory, La Réunion, with the concierge of Paris and a lawmaker, uh, actually a law counselor from who is living now abroad in, in Germany. And with them, you have the facilitators, and that's the other part that is very important. The fact that this is, uh, you need to create a space where the discussion can, can happen, where there is trust and where people will express themselves, even though they do not have a background that push them towards public expression, et cetera. Um, so uh, they also had some uh, witnesses or observers, and here, uh, you may recognize Bruno Le Maire, the economy and finances minister of France, coming with a delegation of uh, MPs uh, from the French Assemblée Nationale. And we had also uh, researchers, academics, and some public for some parts, but that was also the, the tricky part to allow some access. And most of the sessions were with web streams uh, when they were happening with the, uh, with the plenum of the 150 members. And uh, I really like this uh, photograph because it also um, shows the position, the very uh, singular, very special position of policymakers being in a place where they would listen and not speak. Nothing was expected of them, but just witnessing, seeing uh, the debate and, and most of the, the observers who were very impressed with the quality uh, of the debate and the fact that they, they, they there have been some bickering on arguing etc but everything remained in a very in a state of respect and listening among the participants uh, I remember one of the members of parliament going out and telling us like I wish we could have that in the French parliament the state of the nation would be very different I guess it's a very easy co comment to make, but still, it had the, the power uh, of seeing or fellow citizens de debating in that frame was was very strong, and it left a mark on the people who were able to come. Um, and basically, just wanted to share this image that was uh, that shows, um, the, I think, the hope and the the. Uh, the, the pride actually of the members uh, who were leaving the Elysee Palace after meeting with President Macron and presenting him with the proposals. And uh, I think maybe if I was only to quote or to point at one thing uh, about the French CCC, it's the fact that it's proven uh, incredibly transformative to its members and uh, they for, for their agentivity they've committed and they've stayed committed the, all along the profit process through, uh, despite the fact that they had horrible conditions sometimes to work. There was a the stress of the pandemic as well. Some had uh, health issues, some had also close ones uh, struggling or who actually left during the pandemic. So, but many have found ways to stay in the process. We had a very low dropout rate. And many of them are still actually uh, continuing or pursuing this commitment uh, to ring in France for some, and they're, they're still presenting their proposals and presenting the process. Um, so that, that was important. And that, that was that's not always something that you can count on. I think when we started the French CCC, there were um, many members expressed the, the fact that they were afraid they were going to be manipulated or that the government was just handing over to them the hot potato of the carbon tax. And uh, very quickly, they, they actually gained and they exerted some power also for us as organizers. They've asked us to change the agenda, to broaden the perimeter of their proposals. They've challenged us or asked us, like, is there a limitation for the proposals? And to a question to, to which we never really answered. So that's how they ended up. And I'm going to come to the outcomes now to their 149 proposals. Uh, so almost one per, per member. 
Um, so, as I said, the, the, there was a limited time frame that was a bit extended. There were turbulent conditions, but the CCC has managed to deliver on its mandate and to uh, publish a report that has roughly 500 pages, I think, uh, that comprehend uh, 147 proposals uh, that have to do with housing, transportation, consumption, etc. Uh, a very wide range of, of policies that includes also education um, and advertisement, ma many proposals that for them, when they express and when they talk about the report, it all makes sense and everything is very connected. And that is true. The, 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 I think many observers have pointed the fact that we don't know how much the, their proposals could um, help us in the effort towards minus 40%. But we know that altogether they have a demultiplying effect, pr probably. So those were proposals for policy measures, and they also included two uh, uh, proposals or requests for amending the French uh, Republic's constitution, something that was uh, allowed or that the government had said they could do. Uh, but instead of submitting a whole lot of proposals, they just went for one that would include climate action as a uh, one of the higher principles for the French Republic to act on. So that would be the revision of Article 1. And another one that would, a referendum that would recognize uh, in France uh, the, the notion of ecocide and all the damages done to nature. Um, so basically that's this very comprehensive report uh, is interesting and um, Unfortunately, we do not have an English version of the full text, but there is a summary on the website of the CCC uh, that, that really shows the fact that they've tried as much as possible to go for incentives and not just obligations or bans, etc. that they, they've been depicted as being uh, green radicals. But when you look at the details, um, I believe that they, they they are not, they, they were not those kind of people because every time there was also uh, derogations or exceptions to make or considerations for um, the lower income households, et cetera, they, they've tried to take that into account. And it's then it's a whole debate about uh, effort sharing, et cetera. But it's, uh, I, would, I would really invite you to, to have a look at the, their proposals there. Um, as to their impacts, it's interesting maybe to point at the fact that um, they've had in the week uh, following the, the CCC's votes and proposals uh, show a poll was commissioned by one French NGO that showed that they had the support of the French population on, on many proposals. Um, but first that seven out of 10 people in France had heard about the convention and its proposal, which seems very important. Uh, I don't think that there is anything apart from the football cup or stuff like that, that, that can reach that level. Uh, three out of five people considered that the convention was legitimate to make recommendations on behalf of them or the French population. And 64% um, uh, had heard uh, of the convention and considered that uh, its work was useful to fight climate change and lead to uh, the, the green transition in the spirit of social justice. Um, and basically they, there was actually another study that was done and published later on that showed that uh, based on other polls that were done in the past, uh, the proposals of the CCC were uh, mostly supported by the French population every time they were polled or asked about this, apart from one proposal, one that was uh, rejected by President Macron, that was to lower the speed on highways, the speed limitation on highways from 130 kilometers per hour to 110, uh, something that also contributed to uh, get them or to, to get uh, huge media attention at the time. 
Since then, so the government has proposed two law to the parliament. Uh, one um, <clears throat> has been actually adopted and voted this summer. Sorry. <clears throat> And the other one um, that uh, tried to uh, implement or to that was sorry another one that needed to be um, supported by the parliament before going to the referendum of the general population for the revision of the constitution but this one has been blocked by the senate but it's interesting also to see that other stakeholders have committed to support or implement uh, some uh, proposals of the CCC. This includes mayors. Uh, we also had elections at the end of the CCC and uh, a group of the biggest cities in France have committed to implement several of their proposals as to speed limitation, uh, pollution protection, etc. And uh, of course, NGOs and youth uh, climate movements have been very vocal and this is a picture uh, that you can see when the law, the climate law was debated in parliament. Uh, and despite the pandemic, there, there have been two march, climate marches organized in France. Um, but also, and uh, it recently started in France, we have a, a sort of a climate assembly that is being organized uh, by the private sector to help design uh, roadmaps for their companies. Um, towards net zero and also building on uh, the CCC proposals and trying to adapt them uh, for the private sector. And those are just examples that are very numerous. So basically, and maybe just to conclude here, uh, I think that, and as I pointed, those climate assemblies are transformative for their participants. And the whole issue now is, how to make them transformative for more people, more stakeholders in society. Um, we've also seen in France the fact that the proposals have shifted a bit, uh, or tried to shift the debate uh, on some policy measures and policy debates. They, they are, there is actually a bigger debate about um, the conditions upon which uh, flights uh, should be uh, constrained in France or limited. There, is, there are debates about the future of railroads. There, there are debates about advertisement and the fact that uh, there might be some incompatibilities between some advertising and uh, some kind of uh, products and services. Um, and they, so they still nurture that. However, and maybe that's a downside of it, I think that the follow-up uh, after the end of the CCC and the fact that there has been huge criticism on the climate law project from the government and also coming from the members of the assembly them themselves being very disappointed uh, on, on this implementation, uh, it also contributed somehow to a, a a bigger, stronger polarization on green issues and debates. And this is also happening ahead of a presidential and legislative elections for us. Um, and also based on some polls, the climate assembly itself was not enough to rebuild trust uh, between citizens and politicians. We have not seen anything like that. And we, we also have actually a poll that shows that more people in Germany, or actually, less people in Germany, Britain, and Italy see climate assemblies as, as something that is um, not useful or a competition to uh, MPs. And this share is a bit higher in France. And I'm no researcher here, but I think that it also can, uh, we, we can suspect the fact that we have worsen the, the trust gap that can exist if you don't follow up rightly on that kind of proposals. And, and that, that will be all for me. I'm just, uh, I would like to point to the fact that uh, the, the climate assembly in France, but also the one in the UK and others have contributed to the setup of a knowledge network on climate assemblies uh, at knoka.eu that also tends to and will try to look at uh, those kind of elements and how we can link it to the more global discussion that is happening at the European level where 
the discussion is not about saying if climate assemblies are the unique and perfect fit for every problem, uh, because of course they are not, but they can probably help us go in the direction of uh, uh, bringing the change uh, that is required uh, for more trust and more dialogue in the overall Green Deal discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lise, for that your really interesting insights on the, the French Convention Citoyenne pour le Climat. Um, there is a practical question in the questions and answers box, Lise, about references for the studies that you mentioned in your slides. And either I invite you to respond directly into the Q&A box, or you can send those references afterwards by email and we can distribute them to the participants. Um, but I think both your discussion and your presentation and that of Zirmid um, nicely links to the discussion we'll now have with Kasia. And that's really about the European context, because so far many of the experience we have um, of citizen participation, and especially when it comes to assemblies, has been at national or uh, subnational level. So how do we translate that to a European context? And we also see now we have citizens, citizen panels under the future of Europe conference context um, is kicking off. So there's some very interesting innovations also being attempted in any case at European level. And from what we see from both Dermot and Lise, the, the outcomes and impacts can be quite varied. So it would be very interesting, Kasia, to hear how you with the European Commission are approaching this. I'll hand the floor to you now. Many thanks, Claire. Hi, everyone. Um, I was debating with myself whether I should blur the background um, to make more professional, but actually um, the European climate pact is about being human and about people uh, and who we are and in what worlds uh, do we live. So I decided to keep it because the, the motto and the guiding principle of the European climate pact is my world, my action, our planet. So here I am sitting in my world as a mother, uh, as uh, today an ill uh, European Commission uh, employee. So apologies, I hope um, I can still deliver. I really wanted to be here because I would have listened to this debate anyway, because I myself am a huge fan of, um, of assemblies and of uh, participative democracy. I've done it in my own private time as an activist doing some democracy workshops and also in my jobs throughout the commission doing participatory processes with citizens and stakeholders on different policies. And why? It's because um, I believe that, um, okay, it was mentioned, Lisa mentioned that maybe the French assembly contributed to the bigger polarization, but I don't think it's the, it's the assembly, it's, it's the fact that people started to notice and started debating. And actually this is, um, I think, a very precious outcome because especially in terms of a policy like the Green Deal, uh, a policy which touches upon everybody's lives in our little worlds, there isn't any other way. You cannot do it top down because there will be revolutions. You need to try and see how to involve people in the debate. So in that sense, um, the pact, it's what uh, Guillermo mentioned, that a good topic for a deliberative democracy method is where there is a wide concern. There's definitely wide concern about um, the green transitions that need to happen. And it's a dual wide concern. Some people consider uh, the proposals that are now on the table in the Fit for 55 and the climate law as insufficient, while other people consider them as excessive. So how do you then align it? Another element of the debate we are in and the climate pact is an integral part of the green deal is that the differing views um, span across borders this is not that everybody in poland i'm polish so i can talk about it everybody in poland considers let's say proposals as excessive and um, further in the west everybody agrees that they are fine or there are people who, who also rightly so may say that they are not, not sufficient. Actually, these the polarization is much more across political parties debates, which makes it even more difficult because we then become hostage, the topic becomes hostage of political 
view rather than scientific base. Uh, and this is also the paradox of it all, because if you look at the scientific base, there should be no discussion about whether we should be doing something or even what we should be doing. There may be some discussion about how we should be doing it, um, but voila, that's not the case. So, and I think um, because um, it's such a heated debate and because it touches everybody, it only but deserves having these, um, these discussions done. I will share my slides to uh, show you what we're trying to do in the European Climate Pact. Um, can you see my slides? Yes. Okay, thank you, Claire. So, um, as I said, it's my world, my action, our planet. Why? Uh, as I said, because it touches everybody, we were, uh, we've decided to try. And the fact is only kind of, uh, it started really at the beginning of the year. So we are still in the, in the building phase where we actually are very open to listening to, to peoples and stakeholders and experts views on how to do it um, better or differently. But we want to test things in effect. So um, my world means that everybody in our worlds can do something. So here I am again as a mother, as a communicator. There you are as academics, as business owners, as students. And if we decide that in our worlds we can do something, in this case, no action is too small and every action counts because that's, that's the kind of turning the vicious circle into a virtuous circle. Since you cannot do it from top down, you have to do it bottom up and you need to, you need to try and build consensus and you need to try and bring the debate away from the polar bear standing on the iceberg that's melting into my garden. My garden where the, the grass is, is getting dry because uh, we had um, 10 years of consecutive um, hotter summers um, into my world where maybe I need to start reflecting on what do we eat? That's a very difficult one. It was mentioned that the tax on agriculture, it, it's super difficult to, to propose something like that, you know, especially uh, from Brussels. So the debate, um maybe needs to be a bit more um i as a mother in my world um actually like my plant-based delicious uh, foods that i can produce and then these are actions that can be big and small that contribute to to our planet i am trying to move to the next slide and um we have the eurobarometer where citizens across Europe actually say that um, they are concerned that they have taken at least, uh, at least one action to tackle climate change. Um, and they agree uh, that greenhouse gas emissions should be reduced to make the EU climate neutral by 2050. Um, this is the, what, was, what was discussed, this is the survey, but then of course what happens when you start discussing uh, what did you do? How, how can we do it? Uh, it becomes much more complicated, but it's definitely an amazing start. So um, this is the kind of questions we're asking. Um, and this is the kind of small actions that we can all do in, in our worlds. Here we have actually partnered with, um, with a global platform, Compass In, uh, because it's not a European challenge, it's a global challenge. So um it, it just makes sense to you know there's enough work for everybody and so we don't want to reinvent separate platforms for um, individual commitment commitments of people so um we have partnered with them and we are trying also to see across across the world in, in fact how it's going like what are people willing uh, to do in their world and then that's my, one of my favorite ones and it's a fun one uh, as well um, because we know that scaring people in communication around climate doesn't really work. Uh, we've all seen the, the fires and the fires are closer and closer. I, was, I happened to be in Athens when, uh, when the forests were burning around. Um, and you know about it and you sort of keep on going on your holidays, which is there something we should 
continue doing? Probably yes, but, but at the same time, uh, climate practice about trying to find and um, and bring it and bring back the questions to our everydayness. So here you have a bottle of wine, Bordeaux, um, which is which was produced by one by wine and uh, green activists um, who produced a, a Bordeaux. Uh, as it will probably taste in 2050, when some of the wines that are needed to, some of the grapes that are needed to produce the wine would have disappeared because of the droughts. Um, and other wine lovers that have been invited said, um, but that doesn't taste like Bordeaux. And this is how you kind of bring the, the issue uh, more in, into, into, the, into people's um, um, reality. And the second one is, uh, and that's actually an advert of a football game, uh, and it, it says, um, it's a provocation where it says, today is the last day we will ever play on our uh, stadium. Um, that's because our grass is completely dry and so we cannot do it anymore. So like that, you are trying to see what are people concerned uh, with in their lives and, and, and put this debate um, and reframe, reframe the debate because if we stay only at the policy questions, then there might be more polarity issues. So that, that's the scary part. I will not go through it. Uh, it's, it's kind of, it's important when you're having a political debate, but actually, uh, and I test that, I talk to people on my holidays in, in different parts and people, this is not what you can start with. People don't listen to the bad news anymore. But of course you need then the, the data once you start engaging with people. And then uh, with COVID, um, in a way, um, it helped in a sense that, you know, we started to reflect like, where do I live and what, what world do I want to live in? So this is a kind of starting point. It's a very good starting point of, of the, of the uh, deliberate processes that I have taken part in. Like, what Europe do I want to live in? And everybody wants to live in a green Europe or green city or green street. But so if I want to live in a green city, what does it mean? What does it mean for me as a citizen of this uh, town? Or, uh, but what does it mean for the mayor? Can the mayor? What does the mayor need from me as a citizen to make it happen? Uh, these are the kind of um, models. It was mentioned that indeed there are many examples of um, these types of engagements, but they're not super codified. And so I will definitely um, join the the, the knoka that you that Lisa mentioned. Um, but we need. Uh, to be able to kind of find um, more of these models to see at which level and what purpose exactly can we uh, deploy them to have a conversation, what world do I want to live in? And uh, in, uh, at the same time, of course, COVID meant that many people say, well, I have different problems now. But actually, it's the same problem. And this is my favorite one to show that this is the same uh, problem in a sense. We say save the planet, but um, the earth could say, say, could say, save the human. And so uh, to some people, it might feel like we, with the fact we are shifting responsibility to the individuals, but we are not um, because there is, there are um, laws on the table. The thing is they're on the table, part of them have been enshrined in law across, but the fiscal 55 um, is up for discussions. And in order for these discussions uh, to go deeper, it's then which tax and at what level, especially that taxes are actually national responsibility and not the EU responsibility. We want to see and, uh, and understand better what are people saying when they talk to their friends and when they are at work um, and what does it mean something to them. So voila. So, and I personally believe, and it's also on this slide and our team believes that you cannot do a transition like that unless you do at the same time the, the European action by, by citizens. So the climate pact when it was, it was launched, um, like one liner on it, it's bring together everyone who wants to take action uh, for our planet. And the fact is both about awareness and action, as, as I mentioned, Every corner of Europe has a different narrative um, around um, climate, uh, and it runs uh, not regionally, it runs rather 
based on people's values. That makes it, of course, even more difficult because in order to discuss values with people, you have to be really close to them. And that's not so easy to do from, from Brussels. So, and the pact is for everyone. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to see where in each of these types of stakeholders, there is a human element. Um, so you will see in, uh, in, for businesses, we have, uh, we have pledges that I will mention, but we're trying to see in these pledges, I as a um, business owner, uh, what can I do? Or I as an employee, is there something that I can do? Uh, and one of the, so far, at the beginning of the pact, most successful um, ideas that we had uh, was to ask people, would you like to be a climate pact ambassador? Uh, we have currently 500 volunteers on the website with 500 more waiting to be accepted because anyone can apply to, be, can, to become an ambassador, but we're having a look like, what do you want to do as an ambassador? Our idea was that these are people who are multipliers because, um, you know, I can go to so many conferences, um, but will people listen to somebody sitting in Brussels? Not necessarily. Uh, so these are these people are a bridge, a two-way bridge to discuss climate with others, to see what actions they are doing, um, to be a relatable inspiration in what they are doing um, to their friends and to their network. So um, if you feel that um, you have something to offer and you would like to become part of our ambassadors, um, we try to support them the best we can. Um, and uh, many are happy because they found people who, who think alike and um, and they can also discuss like what, what do we do then or, or do practical actions together. Some examples, we have Francesca in Paris doing uh, green corridors and, and some violence. We had uh, an Olympic rower who at the time of COVID couldn't go, there was no Olympic Games, so he was um, fishing out plastic from, from water. Uh, we have mayors, we have scouts. Um, these people are amazing, and, and, and the big, um, big advantage of having them is that they are re relatable, and, and they can be this, this way bridge in, in engagement, in engaging with people that we can never engage. Um, one element of that is what I mentioned already, Compass In. So as an easy first step in this engagement, uh, you can take a commitment uh, and also feel you are part of something bigger, but also understand how, uh, you know, how to do your first step. And then if you're more advanced, um, there are also pledges, as I mentioned, for organizations and also for some ambassadors who represent organizations. Uh, so as mentioned, it's nothing new in the sense that there are pledges for businesses already. Some of it, there is a fear that it's a greenwashing, and there can be. But here we want to go beyond the, the classical greening of the servers. Um, uh, we want to see how can you engage your employees? How can you um, encourage them to, to maybe have more plant-based plant diets in the canteen or uh, encourage less flying and more trains in, your, in the business trips you're doing? Um, and the, but I think the most interesting uh, way of engaging is joint pledges that we're trying to see how to, how to um, facilitate. Um, and that's when, that's when um, a city, for instance, engages with, um, with a company. Let's say a company wants to green their fleet of cars, but the charging stations are not actually located where the drivers live or actually the electric electricity in the city is from coal, so that's a bit useless. So maybe there can be some cooperations like that. And this is also where citizens um, can make, um, uh, uh, can postulate uh, towards the city what they would like to see. And then finally, last but not least, we have this big uh, Convention Citoyenne. We are trying to do little ones. We are launching in October. Um, a methodology with a toolkit where we will encourage first our ambassadors, but anyone really, uh, to do peer parliaments with their friends and colleagues because everybody in, I in my bubble have people who are not convinced um, necessarily or there is a need for a, a debate. So um, we want to give people 
set of questions and, and a set of uh, fun material so that they want to give them around three topics for now, mobility, energy, and sustainable um, consumption, and ask them to have a, a chat around the table with their friends and colleagues and then report back. And, and um, the outcomes of that will feed on the one hand to the future of Europe, um, big debates, but also to our debates here so that when we you know, discuss with politicians and they say, well, in my country people don't want it. Well, actually we've got, um, we, we, hear, we hear that there are people who, who are ready for, for some of the conditions. So, um, voila, this is the way to engage with the five focus here uh, in case there are, um, there are questions and comments, many thanks. Thank you very much, Kasia, for those comments and also for introducing us to the, the vision for citizen participation in the, the European Climate Pact. Um, and I appreciate it particularly that you were able to join us despite being on sick leave, and I hope you get better very quickly. Um, for other constraints, I'm going to first myself open the floor for questions. I'd invite everybody who's still with us to post questions in the question and answer box. We have about a um, bit more than 15 minutes for questions. Um, but I want to immediately turn to Dermid for a quick response to this question, as I know that you will soon have to leave us to, to move physically to a classroom to teach, which is, I guess, quite exciting in considering the past year and a half. Um, but I'm going to direct a question to you that I think it links your discussion to the discussions that were earlier. And that's about the, the the question of impact. Um, and I think what we see between the academic understanding of what impact there can be from such citizen participation processes is that it often depends on the aim of the process and the possibilities within the, the context within which it happens. So for example, at the EU level, we see there aren't as aren't such similar possibilities for a citizen's assembly that you have in the national context, but also the aim of the citizen pact within the European Green Deal is very specific on achieving climate neutrality, whereas other democratic participative processes have maybe different objectives. So um, how you can bring all this together in the in a, in, to think about the impact question that you raised in your presentation, I'd be very interested in, in seeing that. Um, and I also want to invite others to put their questions or comments in the chat, uh, into the questions and answer session and box, and I will come to them in a moment. Dermot, I give the floor to you for a few last words. Thanks very much, Clara, and apologies to everyone that I'll have to leave uh, earlier. As, as Clara said, I'm in, in the very unusual and exciting um, situation of, of having to walk across my university campus to go to a classroom rather than simply being able to log off this call and log straight on to another uh, Zoom call. So apologies, I'll have to leave a, a few minutes early early for that. Yeah, I, I mean, the, the, so the, there's no easy answer to, to that question, Claire. Um, uh, and coming back to the uh, my my own sense of the Irish process, I, I, I think uh, the, the context matters in, in other ways as well. So um, I think part of what played in favour of the Irish Citizens' Assembly and the impact that it had wa was precisely the fact that Ireland at the time was doing so poorly on cl climate change. And, and this was pre-Greta Thunberg, this was pre-school strikes and, and all of that, the, the societal uh, awareness around climate change in, in late 2017, certainly in Ireland, was nowhere near where, where it is today. And so if a similar process was rerun or was, was run for the first time in Ireland today, I, I, I suspect it wouldn't have quite the same impact that it had in 2017 uh, as a function of, of that, that, um, that, that wider context. And, and I, I think uh, it, you, your, your question calls for um, kind of uh, detailed consideration and, and I guess bespoke uh, ar ar arrangements. So, so there, there, there isn't a one size fits all. And, and, and in, in my remarks, I, I noted that there hasn't been a codification of you know, institutional design. Um, but that's, that's not necessarily or certainly not entirely a, a criticism because national 
political and institutional contexts differ quite quite widely. So what works in one country might not work in, in another country um, or, or um, and even what what happen, what works at, at a national level, for example, in one country might not work at subnational level in, in, in the same country. Um, so, so I think we need to be uh, cognizant of the, the, the context, but at the same time, uh, and, and this is um, this is something that we're trying to think through in the framework of Kanaka that Lee's uh, talked about. I, I, I think we need to avoid going to the other end of the spectrum, which is just to say it depends. Um, you know, every, every every case is completely unique, um, and so that answer is a bit of a cop out. <laughs> but 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 I think um, I, I think we need to find some middle ground between. On the one hand, saying there is this one kind of gold-plated model that, that works perfectly, and on the other hand, saying we can't draw any generalizable uh, lessons. Uh, and, and part of the work that's that's ongoing within the Kanaka, the Knowledge Network on Climate Assemblies, is precisely to try and kind of add more um, nuance to, to those discussions. Um, so I'm not sure if that's a helpful answer, but I think it's the best I can do for now. Before I go, Claire, I wonder, could I um, pose a, a question to Kasia? And, and, and then, unfortunately, I probably won't be able to say to hear, hear the answer, but um, I, I was struck by you, you had that one line um, uh, summary of one line or description of the, the climate pact, uh, pact, and it was something like bring together everyone who wants to take action. Uh, and, and that immediately, in my mind, posed the question of what, what about the rest of the population? You know, I, I, I think the challenge always is to, you know, and you touched on this elsewhere in your, your presentation, but the challenge is always to try and reach beyond um, the, the already in, engaged. So um, I, I guess it's, 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 it's a comment on, on that one-liner dis description, and, and maybe I'm placing too much emphasis on, on that one line in, in your whole presentation, but I'd be interested in, in your, your, your reflections on whether that says something about the thinking uh, on, on the part of Vice President Timmermans and, and, uh, and, and the EU institutions, or am I just reading too much into this? Thanks very much, Dermot, for your response to my question and uh, for your question to Kasia. Luckily for you, the session has been recorded, so you'll be able to see the response that Kasia provides, even if you have to leave us shortly. Um, Kasia, I'll give the floor to you to respond to that. And then next, I will turn to Lise to respond to a couple of questions from the, from the Q&A. Kasia, you can answer now. Many thanks, Dermot. Before you go, uh, I need to change that one-liner uh, because then as I kept on, you know, when, when I got the fifth parliament and also the ambassadors, uh, this is exactly trying to reach the unreachable because from Brussels, indeed, you are reaching the ones that are already taking actions or the ones that are screaming loudest because they're not happy, but you're not reaching the ones that are lukewarm, as we call them. Um, they Maybe they don't care, maybe they don't see it as a problem. Uh, but the once, once we reach them, if we manage to reach them, and it's more, you know, it's easier said than done, uh, what needs to happen is some sort of action and may it can be a, the smallest action that's why i was showing these counters in steps you know bike bike more and so on uh, because indeed uh this is the objective however um you need to you need to start with the ones that are already taking action so you need to start somewhere and because the the, the spectrum of the pact is so wide it's from the skeptics to the to the real activists you have to start somewhere. So if you start with the ones that are already taking action, and these are the ambassadors, then you can try to get to the ones that are not, and that will not talk to me or, or you even, but may talk to um, somebody in their environment, in their bingo club, in their um, school or, or company. Uh, and this is the first step, and then to turn it into action. The emphasis is on action because Sometimes people feel overwhelmed and they say, well, this is not for me, this is for the industry and policy makers. But uh, if we want to close the circle, I as a customer actually have a lot of leverage over industry. So I can say, well, I keep on buying stuff in plastic because this is what industry does and there's nothing I can do about it. Well, that's not true. My 15 year old daughter who is vegan, she doesn't buy anything unless she decides it's green enough. And this is what I keep on saying, these are not customers, of tomorrow, these are already customers of today. So it's really, uh, so 
I'm gonna change that quote to, to be more inclusive, <laughs> to show that we are trying to go beyond, but the action stays there, but the action, it, it goes from the smallest to, to the biggest and to show that as individuals, we also have power because I would, otherwise we are in this catch uh, problem where you know we wait for the, we can wait for the industry or for the regulation to happen, but we, we as individuals have, have power in our hands as well, especially together to do stuff. Thank you very much, Kasia, and thanks, Dermot, for joining us today. Um, Lise, I'm going to turn next to you for a couple of questions that are more specific to the um, Climate Assembly um, and how it functions. So there's a question about how often the members of the, the Citizens' Assembly, if they change or if they're constant members. I think in the Irish case, these were constant members. I'm pretty sure it was the same for France as well, but I, I'll let you respond to that. And also how they communicate with the public or if they do. Um, there's also a question about whether or not they work as volunteers. Um, of course, this depends on the design of many of these assemblies, but you can speak from the French perspective and experience. Yes, sure. And thank you for those questions. Uh, it's important aspects that I should have uh, tackled before. Um, so they were constant members. So once they've enlisted, they were supposed to stay until the very end. And as I, I pointed, we had a very low um, dropout rate. So approximately around 50, 15 members uh, left the assembly, uh, but we had uh, some substitutes that were joined to pro that were included in in fact, they were not 150 members, but a bit more than that. And this allowed us to keep, uh, to maintain the representativity of the plenum. That was very important because the people who tended to drop out were people with jobs where the employers were not that flexible, et cetera. And it was very important at the end not to end up with the, uh, you know, the usual medium or high managers uh, living in urban areas, etc. So we had to watch out for that. And I'll, I'll allow myself to say that also having worked with um, elected representatives for quite a while in the European Parliament in the past, um, at some point people, when, when they are in that position, tend to develop uh, some attitude or um, let's say bad habits that could go with uh, the long-term mandates, et cetera. So it's also important that those processes remain in a way short for them to fulfill the mission they were entrusted with, but do not consider that they are somehow elected or they are, that they are entitled to have a more prominent voice than other people. Th this was only for a couple of them, but it's also interesting to see how you can become a professional uh, at uh, media talk, etc., very quickly. Um, so that's for it. For the communication with the public, um, we had a process um, for people to submit external contributions uh, that allowed NGOs, uh, companies, unions, and individuals to submit their proposals to the assembly. But at the time, we were quite low profile and did not get much media coverage. So we had a basic OK contribution there, but not that big. And also, um, th this led to a very wide and uh, diverse uh, lot of contributions or series of contributions that were taken into account, but not that much. Um, but all the participants uh, said that they were having discussions with local entrepreneurs, with their local MPs or mayor, etc., in between the sessions, and they had many discussions. The information we were providing everyone at the start, and that was very common, was complemented then by all the discussions they had. Very early on, they reached out to uh, parliamentarians to organize discussion with the different groups in the French parliament uh, to let them know of what they were doing in the assembly and also asking questions about the deadlocks of climate policies, etc. So it's quite interesting. And a certain number of them also had contacts with the media and agreed to give interviews, etc. 
uh, and that part uh, also allowed the, the, the assembly to, to gain more coverage in the media. And as to compensation, it's, yeah, it's important. We were taking a lot of time from these people. Uh, three days, uh, every session was three days long. And sometimes some of them had to travel from quite far and had to leave on Thursday. So uh, they got a compensation for the non-work days. They could get uh, support for childcare and stuff like that. It's actually what usually people or what the system, judicial systems organize for citizens' juries. And we've seen that if you don't have an okay level for compensation, uh, then the people who are not going to show up are the people in the most stressed social situations and those are the ones that are already sometimes a bit hard to get so i would advise for anyone who is organizing that kind of process to foresee budget for that and we, we basically had a 5.5 million euros budget which is enormous uh, but that was also the result of the huge political crisis we were at the time and this was seen as some necessary uh, expense of of uh, public funds uh, but people tend to minimize or to, to overlook the cost of organizing that in terms of transport, housing of people, et cetera, and the facilitation, the sortation. Thank you, Lise. Uh, Cassia, I'm going to turn to you. Um, there's one question in the Q&A and I received another question via another channel. Um, this is about whether the, the Climate Pact ambassadors interact at all with uh, the European Parliament and members of the European Parliament. Um, and another question more specifically on the European Commission's vision for um, climate assemblies or mini publics as uh, in the national examples that we heard earlier, is there an, a vision for implementing something similar so that the, the emphasis is maybe also on individuals participating in EU level policy development? Um, and there's a general question that might be interesting for both of you to reflect on, and that's the, the usefulness also of um, citizen participation for developing adaptation solutions and not only mitigation solutions and also in the EU context. Um, maybe Kasia, you could think about those questions and I'll, I'll hand the floor to you. And Lise, there's one more question at the end of the Q&A box for you. If we have time, we'll try and get to that one too. But Kasia, I'll pass the floor to you. Many thanks. So um, Climate Pact ambassadors do what they see as the most relevant for them to reach the unreachable and not the convinced yet. Uh, actually, some of them has, have asked us to give them uh, like a certificate that indeed they are climate Pact ambassadors. And for some of the activists, apparently it really opened doors, for instance, with local mayors um, uh, in Kelvin cities. On the EU parliament, if they feel this is what needs to be done, they can do it. If they need help from us, uh, there's, like, let's see, there's a group of um, ambassadors that would need some support, uh, we, we will support them because this is our way of, of saying thank you to the volunteers because the pact ambassadors are volunteers that also guarantees their kind of independence um on the whether um i would love to organize um an, an eu-wide uh, citizen panel uh, modeled on, on the first one or a recent german one um but for the moment however we have the, the future of europe uh, process and we are feeding into that process with our little parliaments your parliament. So we, with our methodology, we're trying to really go local and then feed what uh, needs to be fed into the into this big process, and then and then we will see. Because actually, there are citizens um, panels organized as part as, as part of the future of Europe process. So um, it's it's sort of there. It's going to happen. It's it started to happen, and it will culminate next year uh, around I think May. Um, and on the adaptation, um, actually, uh, on the 27th, it will be my um, head of unit, uh, Elena Vishner Marinovska, who's also responsible for the climate pact. So, yes, definitely, there is, there is, you know, for citizens' participation, I believe there is space everywhere. I dealt before with startups and SME policy, there was a space for that. Um, there's definitely space for that in any kind of policy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Katia. And quickly, Lise, if I may ask you just to respond then to the question also at the end, um, particularly on the CCC. Um, does the scope of the CCC sufficiently acknowledge the grievances expressed by the Yellow Vest protesters? Um, I 
I think you can see the question too, if you can, yeah. um, in 10 seconds. <laughs> it's it's a, a good question. And among the demands of the Yellow Vest, many were linked to direct democracy and uh, the possibility for to organize referendums, etc. And it's true that uh, the, the CCC was much more narrow in its focus. Uh, but you also have to understand the fact that the whole period was seen as, a, uh, I think, a traumatic uh, moment for, for many people, um, and especially for the participants who were injured or the police, for instance. But th this is not the point here. I think that uh, I don't believe that there could be any citizens' assembly that could tackle every issue that was brought on by the Yellow Vests. But it's interesting to see, and I would point there at uh, another Paris School of Economics um, study that shown that uh, the carbon tax somehow now is in a dead end or deadlock in France due to the beliefs that are associated to that. And they, they've shown that even presented with new facts, new elements, etc., you cannot shift the opinion of more than one out of 10 people, I think, on this. And to me, that's actually a, a very important lesson for other member states and for the European Commission and institutions. The fact that you cannot, um, economists sometimes tend to believe that we have to implement a tool and then you refine it because, oh, it's uh, that you have uh, regressive impacts, et cetera. Uh, but once you've crossed a bridge or a, a gap uh, or this part, you cannot paddle back. And what the European Commission and what we're doing today with the European Green Deal will actually uh, uh, close maybe some doors and maybe open others. But th those choices are to be reflected upon very carefully in a very vigilant ways. Uh, because everybody in Europe reminds, is reminded of the yellow vest. Um, but somehow, somehow we don't know, well, sorry, the lesson from the yellow vest is the fact that one tiny climate measure can become something, can lead to something bigger. And the yellow vest protest was not much more about the carbon tax than it was about social inequality, about all the measures done or uh, adopted against uh, drivers or to, to limit. Uh, the use of cars, etc. So we we all all have to be careful there because once a tool has been broken, we cannot or we we cannot expect to use it again. So I think it's also something valuable when you look at the whole discussion around the ETS two uh, today. And uh, yeah, that's why also the dialogue is needed before and not after because the CCC was not able to fix the discussion about the carbon tax in France. Thank you very much, Lise, for those reflections. Um, it also connects nicely to the, the discussions about policy choices and policy mixes and all sorts of path dependence and dependency and lock-ins that we've experienced in the past, and especially as we're negotiating now the Fit for 55 or the climate package to 2030. Um, so very interesting reflections for the entire policymaking world. Um, with that, I would like to close our session. I'd like to thank our speakers very much for taking the time to discuss and provide their reflections, insights, and experience with us. Um, I'd like to thank all the, the members of the audience who were, who were actively presenting and asking questions. And um, do note that this session has been recorded, so it will be available afterwards to those who have registered. Um, in addition, before we leave, I'd just like to draw your attention again to the GovTran website. Our next event in the GovTran series will be on Monday, and the exact title of that session is A Climate Resilient Europe by 2050, What Implications for Politics and Policy? That's on the 27th of September at four o'clock in the afternoon. I invite you all to register, and thank you all for being here today. <laughs>